Welcome to Das Won't Hunt. I'm Jao Pierre Ruth for Information Week. And in this episode, we are going to be talking about data and in terms of like who essentially who owns me, uh, data monetization, data security, data ownership, data privacy, all these different elements that are you know, converging in so many more ways now, uh, highlighted by some of the um, more high profile data breaches that have occurred, but also the demand and interest that organizations have with making use of data, wanting to use data in, in lots of different ways that might be for lucrative purposes for themselves, might be something that they really want to make have access to for their AI needs. But it's definitely created a you know new kind of like conversation or that that needs to happen about well who's actually got control here and what are we doing with it. Um, today we've got a very you know, very nice full house uh, for the conversation on the podcast. I'm joined today by Eric Avigdor. Of course, I messed it up. <laughs> Chief Product Officer for Votero. Uh, Coben Zweifel Keegan, Managing Director with IAPP in DC. Dana Simberkoff, Chief Risk, Privacy and Information Security Officer with AvPoint. And Jim Coyle, Public Sector CTO with Lookout. All of you, thank you so much, and I'm glad to have you with us today. Good to be here. Yep, thanks for having us. Okay, great. So let's start with some of the bigger, I guess the 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 really high level thought of how much what is at stake uh, from a personal and also from I guess financial perspectives when it comes to the exchange and ownership of data you know it's definitely something that there's organizations have vested interest in and you know more people in the public sector are you know i guess becoming more alerted to uh, an awareness of of you know their component in this so so what is really becoming at stake uh you know on this on the different avenues and COVID, i was hoping that you could kind of speak to i guess the the sense of the stakes that we are seeing these days Sure, yeah, I'm happy to kick us off. And I think um, I would be remiss if I didn't start by just putting a big asterisk on the word data ownership. Um, I think we in the privacy field have thought a lot in depth from whether through scholarship from academics or from policymakers and um, advocates on all sides about the idea of creating property interests in our personal information and have almost universally rejected that idea at every turn. And the reason, there's a number of reasons for that, but really it just comes down to kind of how we think about pers personal information as something that isn't really, uh, can't be turned, can be neatly fit into uh, pro property rights as we see them in the United States. Um, there, I'll just quickly highlight a few challenges. One is that um, it, a property regime around uh, data would create, um, would kind of double down on consent as a model for how we, um, for how we decide what, which, uh, who, who can process and share our personal information. Um, and consent is already very much challenged, um, uh, and try and policymakers are really trying to come up with other ways, uh, because that's currently the, the main way that we, uh, determine, um, uh, privacy interests in the United States is through this kind of notice and choice regime. Um, consent between a company and a person, there's a lot of asymmetric information, asymmetric power there. And if you were mm -hmm. actually giving up um, a property interest, uh, you, you, if you were selling your data to a company, there's no reason to say that um, you wouldn't kind of, you would actually be able to fully understand the um, everything that you were giving up, especially if, if there was asymmetric power there. Um, it also doesn't necessarily uh, help us understand what to do with inferred data, with data about us that a company can uh, come up with based on our behavior and things like that. Um, and it doesn't incentivize good governance uh, if companies can just buy people's information and then have a full ownership interest or even a partial property interest in it. Um, they, there's not the same kind of incentives around trying to safeguard this thing that is essential to us. And I guess that's kind of going back to your question, that's kind of the overall 
uh, way to frame the stakes here. Um, our privacy, our, our data uh, show things about us. They are essential to uh, who and what we are. And so there's a, a thing of there's something special about the information um, that uh, that that describes us that we create that people infer about us uh, based on our behavior and activities. Um, and because of that, uh, regulators like to uh, try to find ways to uh, empower users, empower consumers, and make sure that they have um, rights around their data. Mm -hmm. Great, great, appreciate that, thank you. Uh, Jim, got a question for you. How intense are the conversations these days um, for organizations looking at the data that they've got in terms of not only securing it, you know, versus bad actors, but also the the, you know, the interest and questions that you know the folks that they might be gathering from, be it other organizations, you know, clients, uh, the public in general. You know, how intense is that conversation about? Uh, Kind of you know, sheltering and you know securing it, but then also like I guess responding to questions and doubts that that might be raised. Yeah, great question. So there's kind of two two thoughts here, um, and and it really kind of stems from who are we talking about, right? Now, if we talk about the individual users or the individual uh, you know people, right, where this is their data, this is the data that's about them. Um, it's a very intense conversation, right? So, you know, we provide, you know, a security product. We, we did start in that consumer world, uh, and now we're kind of focusing on the enterprise world. The very first thing that has always come across is, well, hey, I don't want to, I don't want to put some kind of software on my device that gives you access to my data, right? And and so this is a very, you know, it's a conversation that we have every single day, uh, day in and day out, and they are very, very concerned. What are you doing with my data? What can you access? How are you accessing it? Um, and then more importantly, uh, you know, if you, if something ever happens, right? Like what happens to me as an individual? Now, on the other side, we have organizations uh, where they're looking at from a regulatory compliance standpoint, they're looking at, uh, you know, from a legal standpoint, what am I responsible for, right? So from a, a data perspective, where does that data reside? Who has access to that data? Um, and what are my legal obligations, right? So stepping away from the just the the, regu the regulatory side, just strictly talking legal at this point, what am I bound to by whether it's GDPR, whether it's you know the California uh, you know legislation where it's kind of like GDPR, um, probably the best you know data protection that we've got in, in terms of individual uh, data protection. Um, within the U.S., but then they move into the compliance discussion, and they're saying, "Okay, well, you know, if it's PCI, there's a certain, you know, certain set of regulations that we have to abide by. If it's, you know, HIPAA, there's another set." It's a very different conversation, right? And in mm -hmm. some cases, um, there have ultimately identified that, hey, it's cheaper to pay a fine than go through. A whole process that requires re-architecting of my security architect, you know, my my security stack, um, and the costs that are associated with buying multiple different vendors and products, right? They will do, uh, you know, what's called a, you know, kind of the the checkbox move, right? If if a vendor says, hey, I can help you protect this, this, and this, great, let let's get it in, let let's get it deployed, and uh, you know, then then we're off to the races, right? Uh, and then that's where, you know, kind of things like cybersecurity insurance and, uh, you know, incident response teams then kind of have that backstop. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, that still has individuals data that is, you know, kind of out there in, in the open. And, uh, you know, that's that leads to, you know, further discussion on, well, what happens mm -hmm. when my data is out there, right? Like what happens on, on that side? Great, great. Thank you for that. Dana, what is some of the sense of the um, balance or, or, you know, the way things are shaking out, you know, uh, risk versus gain with when it comes to, you know, hosting and having data and being responsible for it? Uh, you know, it, are, are organizations feeling like, you know, yes, it's still, you know, worth, you know, the overall risks that, that, that might be compounded on them because of all the threats that are out there? 
um, you know, where do things really stand right now in case in terms of like, I guess this bouncing act of like, okay, have data, maybe have somebody else have some data, we get it from them instead, you know, is it worth the risk of, you know, what we might be liable for? Uh, where, where do things start to seem to be shaking out right now? Sure. Uh, another great question. So I think the answer will change depending on whom you ask <laughs> um, and their role. Um, certainly for me, um, in my role at Outpoint as a chief uh, risk, privacy and information security, security officer, less is better. Right. So, I mean, my general mantra, and I think that those of my peers, is that um, data should be minimized and used for its limited purpose. That's really the underpinning requirements of most privacy laws like GDPR, uh, which had been previously mentioned, but also just sor sort of from a practical monetary and security basis. Um, if you have it, you have to protect it. Right. So um, if you collect information, you're responsible for it and you need to, you know, know what it is, where it is, who can access it and, and what they're doing with it and make sure that it's appropriately available to people who should have it protected from people who should not. Um, I think additionally, while there's been a sort of a perception historically that more is better, uh, particularly from business users, and that's often sort of fed um, now even by some of the, the um, information that we see coming out around AI, these lar you know, learning models and language models that sort of consume information voraciously. Um, they're looking for data to consume and that was sort of fed also by the cloud with this, again, incorrect per perception, I think, that storage was free. Um, there was a real sort of push to collecting and saving and keeping information in perpetuity. I think we've gotten really good at keeping things and not so good at getting rid of them. And what that does, though, ultimately is one, storage isn't free. <laughs> Two, um, it degrades the usefulness of that information because studies have shown that when companies keep large volumes of information, much of it, is redundant, obsolete, trivial information, copies of copies of copies. And I think that's compounded by people working from home, people having multiple devices, people you know, working on-prem and in the cloud and sort of these hybrid environments. Um, you see this sprawl of information that both makes productivity more difficult and um, increases security and privacy threats and risks, and also um, can really uh, warp these AI models too. Um, so there's sort of like a diminishing return on this more is better model um, that I think is actually why I call AI a security and privacy officer the best friend or worst enemy. Because mm -hmm. what it does is it really, uh, for us in the field, it brings home the message that good data governance, data lifecycle management, good privacy and security protections, which we've been talking about for decades, are really what you need to do. Um, they're really a, now a necessity um, more than ever if you're gonna get the benefit of these new technologies. And so I think that's a plus for consumers mm -hmm. ultimately and for individuals because now privacy isn't only the right thing to do, and sort of a, a you know right of an individual, but it makes good business sense because data minimization and purpose limitation will help you get better financial business results as well. 